Remember the story of Adam and Eve. They'd been deceived by the serpent and they had eaten the forbidden fruit, discovered their mistake just too late. They had time to try and clothe themselves when God appeared on the scene. Genesis 3 verse 13 says, Then the Lord said to the woman, What is this that you have done? The question was asked not to accuse her, but to make the pair of them consider their disastrous situation. And also as a lead-in to his promise, we would give them hope. Quite a number of years later, the question was asked again when Cain slew his brother Abel. Genesis 4 verse 9, then the Lord said to Cain, where is your brother Abel? I don't know, he replied. Am I my brother's keeper? Verse 10, the Lord said, what is this you have done? It was a terribly sad situation. And this time he was banished. Going back to Adam and Eve, instead of making excuses, they might have confessed their sins and owned up to what they'd done for their lives were now in a mess. Now, whenever you get yourself in a mess, the natural question is to ask how you get yourself out of it. And here, by the way, is the story I promised I would tell the children. When my brother and I were just lads, we decided to view, uh, to visit an old disused lime quarry. A lime quarry is where they take stone and they make lime out, out, lime out of it. And the way they do it is to have a big sort of tower and they put in their wood and on top of that they put the rock and then they light a fire. And at the end of it all, the rock is changed into lime. Well, we knew two things about this lime quarry. The first was that there were wild strawberry plants growing there. And since it was, was summertime, there's a very good chance that there would be wild strawberries for us to pick. The second thing we knew about the lime quarry was that there were these big towers and that we could explore them. Well, we went to the bottom of the first kiln and it was blocked. But we discovered that we could climb up around the side and look down into the lime kiln. It was about half full of lime. But the lime was on a slope. So we decided to work our way down, more or less to the bottom of this lime kiln, and see what there was to see. And I can tell you, there wasn't much to see except for a lot of lime. And then we turned around to climb back out. That was when we discovered that the line was very crumbly and the slope was very steep and it was virtually impossible to climb back out. It didn't matter whether I tried to push my brother up or whether he tried to push me up, we were stuck. And in fact, we really didn't know what to do for the best. Fortunately, in my pocket, I had this. Can you see it? It's a pen knife. It's actually the pen knife that I had back then. It's well over 60, nearer 70 years old, this pen knife. It has a blade that's only three or four inches long. And I decided I would try and cut a little step in the line and see if it would hold. Well, it did. Trouble was, that was only the first step and it was already getting hot. So I cut another step and another. You'd be surprised how many of those steps needed to be cut before finally we scrambled out of that lime kiln and we decided to forget the strawberries. 
we decided we would cycle home and come back for strawberries another day. We'd had quite enough excitement for one day. But boy, oh boy, was I glad I had that penknife in my pocket. And so the second question in our series relating to plan of salvation is this. What should we do? Well, as it turned out, there was absolutely nothing that Adam and Eve could do. They couldn't undo their sin. There wasn't anything they could do to make up for their sin. And they were stuck with the penalty for the sin. There's no way they could make things right for God. And in fact, if you'd asked them, they would probably have said, yep, our whole future existence is in jeopardy. Now, as you go through the Bible, you can find other places where people would ask themselves much the same question. What should we do or what should I do? And there's a classic one in Matthew 19 and verse 16. It says this, just then a man came up to Jesus and asked, teacher, what good thing must I do to get eternal life? The young man wanted to make quite sure of eternal life. He seems to have been quite a good living young man, actually, but he wasn't certain of his own salvation. He felt that he could attain it if only he did something extra and perhaps Jesus would tell him what it was. He seemed to think that keeping the commandments would earn him a place in heaven. It wouldn't because only Jesus could get him there. In fact, as Matthew 5 verse 9 points out, 5 verse 19, I should say, keeping the commandments was what he was supposed to do anyway, but not as a means of earning salvation. There really wasn't anything he could do to earn his place in heaven. On yet another occasion, some of the disciples of Jesus came to him with much the same question, only this time it's in John chapter 6 and verse 28. What must we do to do the works God requires? Perhaps some miracle that no one had ever done before. Perhaps spend the night in prayer as Jesus did. What was it that would do the trick? The answer they got was not the answer they expected. John 6 verse 29, Jesus answered, the work of God is this, to believe in the one he has sent. It was as simple as that, to believe in the one whom he had sent. Working one's way to heaven is doomed to failure, but believing in Jesus who was sent to live and die for us will work every single time. So there's an answer to what should I do above all else? Believe in Jesus. Many times in life, by the way, you find yourself in a situation where you wonder how to proceed. And you need to hear someone ask the third question. Can I help you? You're struggling to change your tire and one of the locking nuts just will not budge. And it's music to your ears when someone comes along and says, do you need any help? Or perhaps, can I be of any assistance? Well, there's another variation. It goes like this. Would you like me to have a go? But that one can be disappointing when you find out they're no more capable than you are. We had moved into our present bungalow. Uh, the bungalow needed quite a lot of work done to it. In the kitchen was an alcove. It was just wide enough to take our chest freezer. With three and a half inches on either side, and before you wonder, the answer is I measured it. 
I knew there was three and a half inches on either side and so did my wife who very thoughtfully placed a hook to the left hand side of the freezer. It was, the hook was just a little higher than the freezer itself, but it was a handy little hook on which to hang things. And all went well until one day the builders turned up ready to do some alterations. And the very first thing they did was to move a radiator. Well, at least that was the first part. What they actually needed to do was to lift a floorboard in order to get it at the pipework underneath. And that floorboard was under the right hand side of the chest freezer. So they nudged the freezer along just a few inches, but it was enough so that they could lift the floorboard, do the pipework, and then they were able to shift the radiator. And of course, having done that much, they replaced the floorboard. It was a little later that Joan went to lift the lid of the chest freezer and found that now it snagged on that hook. And she looked at me as if to say, you know what needs to be done. But I also knew that that freezer was absolutely chock-a-block with food. And there was no way I was going to put my back out in order to shift it along just a few inches. Fortunately, one of the builders, who was built like a rugger halfback, saw our predicament, walked over, moved it along with the greatest of ease, and ended by saying, no problem. He was right. The problem was ended once he shifted it but I'm glad I didn't try. However, sometimes those who offer help have more enthusiasm than ability. And we end up disappointed and we wait for someone else to come along and offer their help. And sometimes the help we think we need is actually inappropriate please help me pass this exam, might be okay, especially if we've done some honest work. Help me to be more popular than anyone else, smacks of pride and probably isn't okay. So was Jesus ever asked for what might be called inappropriate help? Well, there's an interesting example of this in Mark chapter 10. Jesus had just finished telling his disciples that he was headed for Jerusalem and that there he would be put to death. Now, at that point, they might have offered their sympathy or at least offered to pray for him. I hope if I came one day to Salisbury and I said to people, I, I am headed for my death pretty soon. I hope someone at least would say, oh, I'm sorry to hear that or at least offer to pray for me. They didn't. We know from Luke 18 that they just didn't understand what he was trying to tell them. But they were convinced that Jesus was soon going to set up his kingdom. And so two of his inner circle of disciples cooked up a little scheme to get the best positions in his kingdom of glory. Mark 10 verse 35 records, then James and John, the sons of Zebedee, came to him. Teacher, they said, we want you to do for us whatever we ask. Now, Matthew 20 says that they got their mother to do the asking. Personally, I think all three of them were in on this little scheme. And we have the reply of Jesus in verse 36. What do you want me to do for you? He asked. Which is another way of saying, how can I help you? And they told him of their selfish ambitions. It's one of the very few occasions in the Bible where Jesus could not help someone in the way they desired. 
we've had a look and I could only find one other, but I'm going to leave that one with you to discover. However, there were other occasions in the Bible when there was a happier outcome. And sometimes, by the way, the help that is needed will come from multiple sources. So consider a little story in 2 Kings chapter 5 and verse 1. Now, Naaman was commander of the army of the king of Aram. He was a great man in the sight of his master and highly regarded because through him the Lord had given victory to Aram. He was a valiant soldier, but, but he had leprosy. He may have wondered, how ever am I going to escape this? But help was at hand. Verse 2, now bands of raiders from Aram had gone out and taken captive a young girl from Israel, and she served Naaman's wife. She said to her mistress, if only my master would see the prophet who's in Samaria, he would cure him of his leprosy. And Naaman's wife evidently told Naaman, and Naaman evidently told the king. The problem was, you see, if this prophet, who was a great prophet, could heal him, how much would it cost? Verse 4, Naaman went to his master and told him what the girl had said. So the girl has helped by telling the wife. The wife has helped by telling Naaman. Naaman is now going to tell the king, and the king is interested and eager to help. By all means go, the king of Aram replied. He's that keen to have Naaman back in good health once more that he provides two things. A letter of introduction to the king of Israel and a small fortune in gold. Shall we say, in today's terms, at least a six-figure sum of money? However, when Naaman arrives in Israel, he finds very quickly that the king to whom he's been sent is worse than useless. However, Elisha tells the king, just send Naaman to me. And Naaman soon arrives at the home of Elisha and announces his presence. Verse 10. Elisha sent a message to say to him, go, wash yourself seven times in the Jordan and your flesh will be restored and you'll be cleansed. No need for money. No need for gold or anything like that. Just obedience. And that was not what Naaman expected. And he felt insulted. Elisha hadn't even come out to talk to him. And Naaman was about to return home. It's at that point that Naaman has some more help. Verse 13. Naaman's servants went to him and said, My father, if the prophet had told you to do some great things, would you not have done it? It's their turn. And they do it by suggesting that Naaman do what he's been asked to do. And he does it. And it works. And now Naaman has another problem. He realized that the God of the Israelites has indeed helped him. But when he gets back home, he'll be expected to go into the temple of a false God. And he shares his problem with Elisha. And Elisha says to him, you can go in peace. Naaman wasn't the only person who received help in the Old Testament. Remember the story of Esther, Queen Esther, and her people who had survived the immediate threat of extermination. But when you read the story in chapter 9, you find that some of the enemies of her people were still out there. She needed someone who could deal with them once and for all. And so she went to her husband, the king. 
the king said to Queen Esther, the Jews have killed and destroyed 500 men and the 10 sons of Haman in the citadel of Susa. What have they done in the rest of the king's provinces? Now, what is your petition? It will be given you. What's your request? It will be granted. It was all she could ever hope for. He was on her side and ready to help. And then, of course, in the New Testament, there's a story in Matthew 20, verse 29 to 31. It's a lovely story, really, despite what the crowd think. As Jesus and his disciples were leaving Jericho, a large crowd followed him. Two men were sitting by the roadside, and when they heard that Jesus was passing by, they shouted, Lord, Son of David, have mercy on us. The crowd rebuked them and told them, be quiet. And they shouted all the louder, Lord, Son of David, have mercy on us. Now, this particular story is also found in Mark 10 and Luke 18. And from the other versions, it turns out that one of them is called Bartimaeus. Anyway, Jesus heard them calling out to him. And despite the discouraging remarks of the crowd, they continued to ask for his help. And he made time for them. The crowd were telling the two blind men, be quiet. We can't hear what the teacher is saying. You see, back then, when a rabbi walked, the common thing would be if he had people following him for him to teach. I remember at college, we had a, a professor there called Dr. Leslie Harding. And we used to ask him if he would come out with us on a sum, summer uh, Sabbath afternoon uh, for a walk. And his standard reply was, I'll come with you if it's a walk, but not if it's a drift. But the reason we wanted him to come with us was not so that we could get some exercise. It's because once we got him started, we knew he would talk. And he was a brilliant teacher. And so was Jesus. And these two men calling out were making it nigh on impossible to hear what Jesus was saying. Jesus stopped and called them. What do you want me to do for you? He asked. Basically, he's asking, how can I help you? If it had been anyone else, they might have asked for a crust of bread or a coin or two. But Jesus was better than either prophet or a king. Although, of course, he was both. They believed that he was the Messiah, the son of David. And so when he asked what they wanted, they asked for the one thing that only he could give. Lord, they answered, we want our sight. Jesus had compassion on them and touched their eyes. Immediately they received their sight and followed him. I happen to think that Matthew missed out a bit at that point. I'd be very surprised if actually once they received their sight, they didn't literally jump for joy. But he put in the important bit. These two had discovered a real friend who could and did help them. And so they followed him. No other activity was appropriate after they'd received their sight. And it occurred to me that this story has something for all of us. Two men who knew what they wanted were not afraid to ask and came to the right person with their need. For their Lord was a man of compassion. And unlike so many others who would have passed by on the other side, he was willing to take the time to listen and to help. And in many respects, we're not so very different from those two men. We all have our individual needs, and not many are either willing or 
able to help us with some of those needs. But Jesus is. He's not only not changed for the passage of time, he's still a person of compassion. And that led me to wonder how many times, in effect, he stood by our side waiting for us to ask so that he can say, how can I help you? For he's ready to make a big difference to our lives too. It's a mental picture worth pondering and then asking yourself the question, what help do I really need from him today? What might he do to improve my life if I was to ask him? Yes, there's the obvious problem of sin, but we know he lived and died and rose again to be able to help us with that. As it says in 1 John verse 9, if we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to purify us from all unrighteousness. One lady came up to me and said, I don't know what God wants me to do with my life. Well, Romans 2 verse 4 says, God's kindness is intended to lead you to repentance. That means a turnaround in your life. And Philippians 2.13 says, is God who works in you to will and to act in order to fulfill his good purpose. In other words, ask him and he'll sh soon show you what his purpose for your life is. You find yourself in a situation where you need the wisdom of Solomon and you realize you're not Solomon. Perhaps to know what course of education to follow, which university to attend, which job to apply for. The list goes on and on. He's already made provision to help you there. James 1 verse 5 says, if any of you lacks wisdom, you should ask God who gives generously to all without finding fault and it will be given you. I know it says there he will give it generously, but better he will give it graciously and you'll be able to deal with the situation wisely. And he does it without finding fault. The fact that you need help, wisdom to handle a situation may be due to the fact that you got your own self into a tricky situation, but God does not point the finger to remind you of your failings. He's there to help. So back to those three basic questions. What have you done? Originally asked of Adam and Eve, who created an enormous problem for each of us, and leaving us wondering, how do I get right with God? What should I do? Answer, believe in Jesus who came to live and die in your place. And how can I help? Not just with the problem of sin, but with every aspect of life. The plan of salvation encompasses far, far more than just sin. And so to conclude, a fourth and final question for you to consider. Could it be that he really, really wants you to bring your needs to him so that he can help you and make all the difference in your life and thus encourage you to follow him and perhaps more importantly, to have your friendship for eternity. And with that, we close. Over to you. No, no, I'm going to okay. Thank you for reminding us um, that Jesus has never changed. He's the same yesterday, today and forever. And he's there for us to ask him to help us because he knows everything about all of us and the answers. So thank you, Michael, very much. Um, it's now time for our closing hymn, so if you'd like to stand, and it's hymn number 100, Great is Thy Faithfulness. <clears throat>
Let's bow our heads. Father in heaven, we thank you that you are so ready to meet our every need. We thank you for Jesus who came to live and die and minister for us and does so without any spot of unwillingness on his part. Help us to turn to you more frequently, more readily, and grant that our gratitude may last through all eternity. We ask in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Amen.